everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Dr. Psych Mom Show. We are going to be talking about nine bucket list sexual experiences, and um, this was a pretty popular video that I, I did. It seems like this resonates with a lot of people, and the bucket list experiences are really not what you might think. We are not talking about crazy shit here, um, but we will get into that right after I tell you to subscribe. My next subscriber episode will be tomorrow or the next day when they come out and before that we have your wife maybe a far more involved grandmother than you expect oral sex on women a lot of stuff about boundaries um let's see Oh, a popular one was when you're arrogant and condescending, often the only way your wife can assert herself is to feel no attraction to you. And the benefits of having sex when you're not already feeling close. And yes, you are supposed to interact with a soft penis. I mean, like I got a lot of good ones. And there's a kind of porn that can help with sex lives. And it's not what you might think. Anyway, so subscribe and you get all of that. Also, always, if you do need therapy or coaching, go to my practice, Best Life Behavioral Health. I have coaches that can work in any state, and I have therapists that are licensed in the state that they're licensed in, which are various states, uh, many in Maryland, and but I have a lot of other ones too. Um, okay, so moving on. All right, what are the bucket list experiences? And what do I even mean by bucket list experiences? So first of all, a bucket list kind of means like something you want to do before you die. But I mean, most of these things aren't just something somebody wants to do once. They're experiences. They're things that people want to really partake in, you know, as part of their sex life. And I, I've gathered this list from basically talking to people for many years in therapy, especially people who are dissatisfied with their marriages or their sex lives. And so, uh, the average person does not does not really have a wild sex life, you know, and I've realized that more and more and more that many people, their fantasies are often not, they, they don't make it to reality. They don't get to act out their fantasies because they don't have the confidence to lead with their sexuality when they are looking for relationships. And many people, particularly those who struggle with self-esteem or self-worth issues, do end up with partners who can be somewhat rejecting in the sphere of sex and affection. And and it, it's like people don't select on these things. So there's like a lot of, there are men, of course, who will say, of course, I wouldn't date somebody who doesn't go down on me. But then there's other men who just do date a woman who wouldn't go down on them despite that being like a pretty big thing that guys want and it will be in the bucket list when I get to that but they just kind of don't think they could get somebody who would like that or they just assume that that's the way their life works and it's those people that that really need to work on their self-image because these yearnings don't really go away in fact they seem to increase greatly in midlife because at that point you know you're halfway through your life and people start to think is this just the way it's going to go that I don't get pretty kind of normative things that other people get I just don't get them and that starts to feel increasingly unpalatable and intolerable the greater um, you know your self-esteem gets as your self-esteem increases as it can with therapy, with age, you know, from from just doing better in life, in your career, perceiving that you are, in fact, a valuable person, which is great. You know, that, that growth is great, but then it can make you feel more dissatisfied with not having certain things. And you could use this post or podcast to spark a discussion. You know, a discussion that where you talk to your spouse and you say, I'm really not comfortable never having these things, you know, at least some of them, at least one of them or something. All right. So so that that that's enough. Uh, that's enough of an intro. So let's get to what some of them are. Right. So the first one is to be pursued sexually. So a lot of guys in particular have gone for their whole life without a woman pursuing them for sex or, or even initiating sex sometimes, you know, and why do men and women both like this? It makes you feel desirable. It makes you feel like you're attractive and you're appealing and that you're really a sexual entity and people aren't just having sex with you because like you're such a nice person. That's not really what people want on a deep level in terms of why somebody would want to have sex with them. It's not like 
like just because they're like a great guy slash gal. It's because you want them. You actually feel desire for them. And this is a major thing that people want is to see desire in the face of, of, and the actions of a partner. The next one is a partner taking control. So I've discussed this a lot. You know, I'd had a whole podcast on why men want women to take control. I have a post on when, well, you know, women want men to be more dominant. And this is an outgrowth of the being pursued sexually, but even more, right? So within the sexual interaction itself, you know that the person, you know, wants to have sex with you, but even then in the interaction, they may be somewhat passive. So in contrast to that, would be the idea of somebody taking control, being more dominant, telling you what to do. This is a relief for a lot of people that are in control all day, whether it's a mom in control of kids or like a a man or woman that's in charge at work or, you know, whatever the case may be. Most adults feel like they make too many decisions during the day and they just want the respite of not making any decisions. And also, of course, you're assured of somebody's desire when they're telling you what to do. You're assured you're going to do the right thing when they're saying do this or do that, you know, and a lot of people really like this, this power dynamic. It's refreshing. It's something exciting. Some people, of course, are very into it and into BDSM and you don't even need to be into BDSM to like the idea of a partner taking control of the interaction because it gives you such a break from being the one who has to be in charge, whether it's as a parent or an employer or whatever. Right. Okay. So what, what do we have next? A one night stand or vacation fling or like a summer fling, anything that is a relationship that's, even if it's a short interaction, that's just based on sex. So not everybody wants to have a one night stand or a fling, but lots of people do. Lots of people like that idea. You could see it by how many movies are written about, you know, movie scripts are written about stuff like that. How, how frequently this is referred to in popular media. It's just, again, the idea that somebody desires you purely for your sexuality and your attractiveness and your body and not because you're like the great person or like a good provider or like a real nice girl. You know, instead, it's just this pure, raw, unadulterated desire. And that's something that a lot of people, especially if they're more in the people pleasing or like the good girl slash good boy domain, you know, of always trying to do what everybody wants and coloring in the lines and being a rule follower especially if you're like that, then this is in contrast to that. This is like the total opposite, where it's just for fun, just for play, just for adventure. So many people don't feel like their sex lives have any element of play or adventure. And this idea of somebody that's only meeting you in that space is very alluring. And by the way, this is the only one on the bucket list that you cannot do within monogamy. So it's, uh, you know, uh, all of the other ones. So if you say, well, what good does that do me? I don't want to cheat on my spouse. Cool. But, you know, I don't want you to cheat on your spouse either, obviously. Um, But it's also sometimes very validating when people have these sorts of fantasies to hear that other people do as well. You don't need to have everything on this bucket list on your personal bucket list. You know, as 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 with anything, you take what you can and um, move forward. But also many people listening to this are single or divorced and single, like either single the first time or the second time. And they think, you know what, that sounds fun to have casual sex because I never was able to do that before. I always thought that like that was bad or something. And I was raised religious or I was raised with so many rules or I was so terrified of rejection or whatever. And you know what? Like a lot of people find that to be fun and liberating to have an interaction that's just based on fun and not based on, you know, finding the next, you know, long term monogamous partner, etc. All right. Uh, next, romantic lovemaking. So this is not just for women. This is uh, particularly for men. Honestly, as I've said many times, men in my practice are more romantic than women, and there's evolutionary reasons for men being able to be more romantic. They can spread their seed anywhere, right? They don't have to worry about a woman um, necessarily... Uh, being the one that's going to help them raise a child. Women have to worry about that because every time you have a baby, it takes like 10 months. Plus you got to nurse or feed them or whatever you got to do. And you need somebody who's going to be there for that. So women instinctively search for more stability and good providing when they're looking for a partner. And men can really just be more romantic and say, oh, look, she looks like an angel in the morning light type of thing. You know what I mean? So um, in romantic lovemaking, 
thinking, I talk to so many people that have never said I love you during sex. And both men and women yearn for a more romantic, lovemaking scenario. You know, and they only see it in romantic movies and some people mistakenly think that this is the only time that that, that actually happens and that that isn't realistic for um, a married couple and it totally is and it's something just by saying I love you in the sexual encounter, you could transform it into something that is more meaningful and by talking in general and, and talking about your connection. So many people like race through and have this silent, rushed experience because they feel awkward. But, but yet that is not how it has to be. All right, next is oral sex. So I've talked repeatedly about how women should not marry a guy who doesn't want to go down on them because there's like guys lining up to do that and they all, like 95% of guys like to do that. So, so let's be real, you do not have to have to settle because this is something that 95% of guys like to do. Now, it's not something that 95% of women like to do, but still, you know, uh, within a loving marriage, within a loving relationship, like most people do try oral sex and many people have it as, as a part Part of most encounters. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not, of course, as usual within long-term monogamy for a woman to repeatedly give blowjobs to completion, but yet that is something that does happen semi-regularly for many couples. So it's not going to be twice a week usually, but it's not going to be never. And so for the couples where it's never, they feel really bad. You know, I mean, I've had a whole post and podcast and stuff on why men like oral sex and oral sex on men and everything. And this is like the only time that a lot of men feel like something in the encounter is purely about them and they get to be a receiver, you know, and it's particularly for men where this never happened to them, it can become almost like an obsessive thing where they really want like a blowjob or a blowjob to completion. And this is really important. If you are single and you're looking for a match and you are a man who wants this, don't end up with a woman who doesn't give head. I mean, like, let's be real. There are women who do that. Lots of women who give lots of blowjobs. Like, you know, I mean, it's it, for for the women that do it, they're always shocked that other women don't do it. And they think that it's a um, like a fake thing, like in, in media, like they're like, oh, haha, that's a joke that women don't do that anymore after marriage. If you're a woman that does it. But yet it isn't like there are a lot of women who kind of just stop doing that because they never liked it. And here's how you could tell if they never liked it. You could tell. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like easy to tell because they don't ask to do it. They don't want to do it. They wipe their mouth out like they just like touch nuclear waste afterwards. They're like, you know, like kind of grossed out. And there are many men that ignore that or like assume that all women act like that and all women don't act like that, particularly in the honeymoon stage. Many women enjoy doing that, you know, because it's an uninhibited time and it's a way to show you know, that you really desire the man and it's it's an outgrowth of your desire. And more women who are more high libido and more into physical touch are definitely going to give oral sex more frequently. And oral sex to completion or, or, or not. Some guys care about that, some guys don't. And again, if you're a woman with a man who won't go down on you, that indicates a low libido and or unusually self-centered man because of how common it is for men to want that and consider it a key part of how they're a good lover, which is a big part of male sexual self-concept is being a good and generous lover. All right. So speaking uh, on the same topic of oral, kissing. So a lot of people, like, let, let's go, like, real basic. A lot of people don't kiss within marriage and don't remember ever having long makeout sessions because they were with a partner who was squeamish about kissing. And I discuss in one of my podcasts or posts about this. There's this book, Three Women by Lisa Taddeo. I don't know how to pronounce it, Taddeo. Um, and she, one of the women that she describes is a woman who had an affair because, like, her husband refused to kiss her. And she was a very uh, physical uh, person, a very sensual person that just wasn't getting that need met. So that's an example of a woman whose husband won't kiss her. And that was uh, based on re uh, real interviews, this book that she wrote. It's interesting. Um, but also I hear it from many men that the woman will not kiss them and that she doesn't like bodily fluids and she doesn't like their taste and she doesn't like this and she doesn't like that. And honestly, the men who end up in that situation, they never had long makeout sessions with the woman. So, I mean, again, if you're single and you like physical touch, long makeout sessions are key to that. That's kind of almost like a 
a proof that's like proof that the woman likes physical touch and then she has a more sensual erotic blueprint like you may so if and I don't feel like anybody should go to their grave never kissing again, you know? So you got to ask your partner. If they won't kiss you, you got to, like, ask them if there's an issue with how you kiss, too, because a lot of women think the man is a bad kisser, but they won't tell him, and they think that it hurts his feelings less to, like, never kiss her than for her to say, like, you have bad breath or you're too forceful or you bite me or whatever. But it isn't. Like, most men, the large majority of men, want to get sexual feedback if it allows them to have a more you know, open and free sex life. And it's sad when somebody, like, I mean, what if your kid wanted a a kiss and you wouldn't kiss them? I know it's a different kind of kiss, you know, but still, you would always kiss your kid. Like, why not kiss your partner? It's, it's, I mean, I know why not, of course, because you have sensory issues and whatever, whatever. But I mean, look, I mean, sensory issues only go so far within the context of what's supposed to be a loving and, and compromising partnership. So, I mean, this is a big one. If you guys can't get anywhere on the kissing front, make sure that the hygiene is is there. Make sure that the person understands how much it means to you. Make sure you've taken their feedback into account. Many people can make some headway on this one, and it's a particularly sad one. Like, like when she talks about it, it was just in the book, Three Women, it's just so, so depressing and lonely for the person who doesn't ever get to kiss. All right, next one is an exploration of your erogenous zones. Many guys, like, never even get touched during sex. Like, the foreplay is, like, all toward her. He's touching her breasts. He's touching her body. And, like, he doesn't even get touched at all. There are many erogenous zones. And, and of course, there are men, less frequent, but there are men who just won't engage in foreplay for the woman and won't touch her as much as she needs to be touched and consider it some sort of a waste of time or that she doesn't work right because in porn, women never need foreplay. And that's, of course, bullshit. Women need to be warmed up, like, massively in order to fully enjoy themselves. And I've discussed this in my podcast that was, like, uh, on female arousal. So that's a good one to, to listen to. But I more often hear this in couples counseling that women won't touch the man at all. And that they, like, almost won't even touch his penis. Like, he has to get it ready and insert it. Like... Like, it's like fucking kryptonite or something that she can't touch it. God forbid she should put it in her mouth, but she doesn't even put her hands on it. And uh, never mind the rest of his body, which might as well not even be there. He might as well be in a hazmat suit, you know. And that's just uh, real depressing and lonely. And a lot of women don't even really understand that men need that in in a weird way because the man doesn't say anything about it. And that's kind of not how things go in romantic movies. That's like you never see foreplay. So many women don't understand that it's supposed to happen toward the man as well. So even just basic education about bodies and sensuality and exploring sensual touch, which is often what people do within couples counseling or sex therapy or intimacy coaching. I have an intimacy coach, Heather, at my practice. Remember, she works in every state. So if this sounds like something that you would want to work on, sensual touching and getting used to touching each other, then you should certainly contact me and work with Heather. But the, the, the point here is that Many men have erogenous zones that have never gotten touched, and meanwhile, they're trying very hard to touch their wife and to figure out if she likes her breast touched or her neck or her thighs or whatever, and, like, meanwhile, like, they have erogenous zones, too, and, and like, the woman doesn't ever touch them because she doesn't, like, literally doesn't touch them, <laughs> you know? I hear about, like, women don't, like, use their hands. Like, it's almost like they don't have any hands during sex, you know? And that is unfortunate and a uh, real real deficit in the bedroom that people yearn to be remediated and in, in their deepest wishes about what their sex life would look like, which is what we're talking about here with this bucket list idea. Um, and then the last one is spending a long time in bed. So many people think that like spending hours in bed is like some hyperbole that has to do, that doesn't have any real world, you know, um, corollary right so like there's no real world person that's spending hours in bed with a partner but there are there are and like it's not all the time but on vacation or on a weekend or on a time without the kids or uh, you know people and especially in the honeymoon stage this is another big one if you are single and you are a high libido or high physical touch person and your partner never spends more than like a half hour in bed with you even in the earliest least inhibited stages of the honeymoon stage then that is not the person for you 
You know, because especially when you are in that early stage, having sex multiple times in an encounter because and it's not because like somehow you have like magic penis that just has no refractory period it's because you're spending enough time in bed touching each other and engaging in foreplay that that you would get hard again you know or not even that you have to get hard again if you're older but that like the woman would you would go again you know for the woman and you would go down on her again or whatever there would be multiple orgasms over multiple hours in an encounter not all the time I understand you have a job but sometimes you know and and on, definitely on like a romantic weekend, on a romantic weekend, that should be kind of like what you do. And you need to have a romantic weekend. Sometimes this could be a real reset to a marriage or even just an overnight somewhere if you really have nobody to watch your children. Or, you know, during the day, because so many people telecommute now, if you took off a day and you both like stayed in bed for a long time, for a couple hours at least, that could be really affirming and very, very much of a of a hard reset to a marriage that that is foundering in the intimacy zone, you know, and that's a lot of marriages. So anyway, if, if any of these resonated with you, it could give you the impetus to discuss at least one of them. You don't want to discuss all nine. Anybody that comes to a partner and says, here's nine things that I yearn for that we don't have in this relationship. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's terrible. It's like if your kid came to you and was like, here's nine ways that you're failing me as a parent. I mean, holy shit. Like you, you may pretend that you would like to hear that feedback, but you really would feel quite depressed and hopeless. You know, it would be a hell of a lot better if your kid was like, you don't blah, blah, blah enough or whatever, like one thing, you know, like just one thing. So try to take one thing of this to your partner and say like, this is something I've always wanted to do and maybe we could do it. Remember, not the one night stand with a stranger. That's not the one to ask for. Um, and, like, if, if this is uh, useful to people, then I could discuss, like, you know, the level up of bucket list sort of stuff, you know, when people have, have wilder fantasies. But the reality is, is I try to make these podcasts and posts applicable to, to the majority of people. And to the majority of people, having these nine things would really be awesome, you know. And, and they don't really need to have, like, a threesome or to have, like, you know, public sex or even anal sex or... or toys or really anything uh, except for a close connected sensual experience and I think that that is what to aim for is one of these things to be something that you bring up with a spouse and say this is something I always wanted and it would you know make me so happy if we could experiment more with xyz you know like you touching me sometimes or like whatever try try to you know you know your audience like don't be overwhelming but just do try to incrementally describe what you need and if it goes nowhere then couples counseling or sex therapy or sex coaching can really be useful because sometimes people just cannot talk about these issues. You know, no matter how many Dr. Psych Mom shows you listen to, it's still hard to get out of your old paradigm where these things are very difficult to talk about and you feel very awkward and flustered and things end in a fight or in silence. And if that's the case, there's really no shame at all in using a third party that's trained in helping you communicate. I mean, you would do it for your kid. You'd get your kid into therapy. So why not for the marriage? All right. Well, uh, hopefully this was interesting to you and um, and relevant. Uh, hopefully it was not relevant, but, um, you know, hopefully it was interesting if it is relevant. And I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day.